Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 744. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is July 29th, 2022. All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin and George sit down on our webcams and talk about anything we see in the news and want to talk about. And there's a lot of news this week. This is the the week of Lambeth 2022, kind of a a, a partial gathering of the uh, bishops in the communion uh, in Canterbury. We'll be talking about that. And we also have some other news we're going to start off with before we get there. But George, before we get to that, we always give a health update because we're of that age where people need to know how we're doing. How are you doing? Well, well, I have all the aches and pains of a person of my age. I'm actually wiped out. I was up at uh, 3 o'clock Eastern time mm-hmm. to see the 8 a.m. press conference from Canterbury. And my uh, body clock is going to be messed up all this week and next week because their press conferences are at 8 a.m. And, eight. and so that means i got to get up at 3 o'clock. I work for a few hours, then go back to bed, then go to have a regular job, and then write in the evening and then get up at 3 o'clock again. So it's going to be a tough one for me. You're, you're waiting for Lambeth to be over and you're not even there and working your tail off. Yeah, it's, it's a strange Lambeth because uh, all the liberals... Uh, own Twitter, they own social media. So anything you hear uh, coming from the Facebooks and the Twitters and uh, the Instagrams is coming from the liberal uh, side of things. And the people who hold all the cards and all the votes and the majority, the Global South, they kind of do the old time press stuff. They're not uh, up to speed on taking over Twitter, which is fine. So you're going to be very surprised this week how things turn out, despite what you've read on Twitter. But before we get there, we got some other news, George, we were going to talk about. Um, somebody's running guns to Haiti. And it's oh, been inferred a, that it might be the diocese, George. Well, uh, as a little bit of background, the Episcopal Church are, is quite keen on gun control. Sure. And at very, whenever the bishops meet or general conventions, they have these protest marches against gun violence and uh, how uh, America should disarm and uh, not have handguns and assault weapons, whatever they are. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, on July 13th, a customs inspector in Haiti looked at a container uh, who was uh, bound for the Episcopal Diocese of Haiti. And this, you know, Haiti, big. Port-au-Prince is a big port, and he happened Mm -hmm. to just randomly select this one, and he opened it up, and the manifest said, this is full of relief supplies for the Episcopal Church. And he opened it up, and he found like 50,000 rounds of ammunition, 18 AK-47s, an M4 carbine, uh, some Israeli submachine guns, $50,000 in counterfeit American currency, scopes, vests, and all this other stuff for a little war and revolution. That's and my dream. That's my put, dream basement right there, George. You know, <laughs> and, and then and so they decided. Well, let's open up the other three containers consigned to the Episcopal Diocese of Haiti, full of ammunition and weapons and uh, various contraband items. Well, turns out Haiti is in the midst of gang wars. Uh, the BBC had a report that two hundred people were killed in the space of one week in one of the Port-au-Prince slums by warring gangs. And the gangs are restocking because Haiti is, uh, as well as Donald Trump called it, a little shithole of a country. Uh, And I'm sorry, he's right. Uh, There's anarchy in Haiti. It's a very violent, very dangerous place. And the state really has no reach beyond the state house doors. The gangs control various neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And they're restocking to fight for control of the various slums. It looks like somebody in the diocesan office used the diocesan seal and was bribed to help smuggle these guns into the country. Because to be perfectly frank, the diocese of Haiti doesn't have the money 
to buy 50,000 rounds of ammunition. No, I, I think clearly the evidence shows that this is not something that's coming from the bishop's office, that somebody lower down had the seal, was able to uh, uh, get the purchase order numbers and everything all snuff and sniff, and they got caught. So it's it's an embarrassment for the Diocese of Haiti and the Episcopal Church because you know here they are the, one of the louder voices for gun control, uh, allegedly now engaged in gun running to Haiti. Uh, quite amusing in one level, quite sad on on many others. Our next story is uh, with Charlie Holt. He is the bishop elect uh, in Florida, and you wrote a story this morning that said he's going to take a priest in charge uh, job with the diocese. And I want to know how that all works out. Well, Charlie Holt was elected Bishop of Florida and immediately protests were filed. Mm -hmm. And the protests are taking two angles. One from within the diocese, uh, some liberal leaders have uh, said that the process was did not uh, follow canonical procedures. What happened was they didn't have a quorum of clergy. And in other words, they didn't have the requisite number there to have a valid election. They had a quorum of lay delegates. Mm -hmm. And so the parliamentarian and the chancellor of the diocese said, well, we it is permissible to have some clergy who can't make it because of fears of COVID or health issues vote via Zoom. And so an election was held uh, under these new rules, which were nobody objected to at the time of the conference, of, of, the, of the special meeting of the Synod, and Charlie Holt was elected. Well, this caused a ruckus. Uh, I talked to one priest, He's a, he was actually a uh, curate in the diocese, and he was fired by his rector when he basically said, well, I think Charlie's going to be great. And it's that level of anger from the sure. left yeah. that somebody who holds traditional stances on human sexuality and abortion and this and that uh, is, a, is, a, is an American conservative evangelical. The difference between that and an English conservative evangelical is American conservative evangelicals were clergy callers and are okay with women clergy. So that was, and then on the outside, gay. Act, so they filed a petition with the presiding bishop asking the election to be overturned and rerun. And the presiding bishop accepted that petition and has kicked it into the machinery of the Episcopal Church to review and go ooh and ah on whether or not they'll rule that election valid. At the same time, a campaign from gay activists outside of the diocese is to be a bishop you have to receive a majority of consents from the bishops and standing committees of the Episcopal Church. And so these people are writing to the bishops and standing committees asking them not to confirm Charlie Holt because he is a conservative to drive him out, drive him out one of two ways. The diocese is fighting both of these and it was announced this morning that Charlie Holt would be hired as a priest on the staff of the diocese, and he's been given a number of jobs to do uh, until this is all worked out. All right, so well, my question then, is this really a good strategy? Are you trying to force the hand of 815, or, you know, I, I, I don't get the strategy here if it's part of a strategy. Uh, well, a conservative approach to this would let the, let Star, Charlie stay at his job at St. John the Divine in Houston, mm -hmm. which, is a, which can afford to continue to pay him. It's a big, massive church um, until he's ready to start, until the process go, runs itself through and he's officially confirmed and consecrated. I think that's a safer course, by the way, because mm -hmm. this hiring him on staff, having him move to Jacksonville from Houston without having everything finished could be interpreted as being presumptuous. And the legalistic types might say, well, it's a little premature. And uh, would this tip it against him? Uh, feelings are so hard in the Episcopal Church, I don't know if anything else could matter, but in this thing, I would have probably preferred to be more circumspect in going forward, 
mm-hmm. than they are with Charlie. But certainly John Howard, the Bishop of Florida, has decided this is what I want to do. Um, and he's taking it personally that uh, the people in his diocese who are causing all the trouble, he's basically trying to say, he's trying to stick it to them, yeah. in my opinion. Well, we'll have to see how it works. But, uh, you know, we certainly support Charlie Holt and his uh, uh, call to be the bishop in Florida. But we'll have to see what happens in this day and age. And speaking of this day and age, it is the day of July 29th and the age of Lambeth. And we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, yeah, one uh, more, Kevin. What, did you I miss promise you'd let me talk. Yeah, Indian corruption. Oh, yes. Promise, we have Kevin, real Indian corruptions. I Somehow my brain just skips over it because it's so common. But this is big because somebody was going to Lambeth and they will not be going to Lambeth because of their corruption in India, George. And it's not because the Archbishop of Canterbury doesn't want crooks there. No. He's happy with because <laughs> there are some real crooks among the bishops present. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, people with active criminal uh, investigations against them. Uh, Dharmaraj Rasalam, the moderator or the head of the Church of South India, we've reported in the past how he has been accused of selling places at a diocesan owned medical college for tens of thousands of dollars and pocketing the money. In other words, it's supposed to be a competitive mission process. But there are some spots set aside for Christians in a Christian-run medical school. And the bishop uh, is evidently angered some people because he sold some of these spots to Hindu and Muslims. Mm. Uh, maybe if he just had kept it selling it to Christians, he wouldn't have had all the grief, but nonetheless. So a complaint was filed, and we reported a few weeks ago that uh, a corruption watchdog asked the government to hold his passport so he doesn't leave the country. Well, on Monday, uh, because the because medical school admissions are governed by federal laws in India that say so many Christians, so many Muslims, so many untouchables, so on and so forth, this became a federal crime. And on Monday, the feds raided the offices of the diocese and the medical school and, and uh, some diocesan officials and went through, you know, spent the day going through finding evidence of the corruption. Bishop uh, uh, Rasalam on Tuesday morning is at the airport at 6 a.m. ready to fly out of India to go to the Lambeth Conference. And as he's going through immigration, his passport is pulled because he's on a criminal watch. And he's told by the immigration department who holds onto his passport, show up at the enforcement directorate's office in Kochi, uh, which is in Kerala state, on Wednesday at 11 a.m. Mm. 11 a.m., the bishop shows up with his attorneys. We have a picture on Anglican Inc., which shows, you know, dozens of photographers around the car as he's, you know, got his hand. It looks like one of these old-fashioned mob photos from New York City. <laughs> we call it the perp walk, don't we? He, he had a perp walk, except yeah. he had his COVID mask uh, helping him hide. Uh, he had his perp walk, and then he was interrogated with his accompanied by attorney, legal counsel, for 10 hours. This is not somebody helping the di- the government with their investigation. This is somebody who's on the hot seat. Yeah. And it turns out that the diocesan secretary, who has also been asked to help the Indian government with their investigations, he's fled the country. Uh, he's suspected of being in Dubai or the UAE or someplace where he can't be reached by Indian law. So this bishop, is this moderator of the Church of South India, is unlikely to show up at Lambeth so long as the immigration's holding his passport and he's helping the authorities investigate uh, massive fraud. His fraud, yes. So His fraud. His fraud. Well, you know, George, you mentioned the great website Anglican.inc. We should talk about Lambeth stories as they appear on there. Um, you got some really good stories that you wrote yourself this morning and put up. Um, all by my little self, Kevin. All by your little self at 3 a.m. Click, 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 click. You know, I was snoozing at 3 a.m., George. I wasn't going to get up. But we should give a little context and background to what Lambeth calls R, the group that put them together, and the controversy about the preamble. Uh, just to give everybody here a good context of, you know, what is going on and why it's going on so 
there's 10 calls. This is a, a new thing for Lambeth. They don't do resolutions anymore. And uh, uh, who put the 10 calls together, George? A team of 50 people. Uh, comprising people from all parts of the communion, some youth delegates, uh, but basically a core group of uh, bureaucrats and senior bishops put together these 10 calls in different areas, mm -hmm. science and technology, the environment, uh, uh, reconciliation, interfaith relations, uh, ecumenical Christian relations, so on and so on and so on. Uh, one of these issues, areas was human dignity. And the human dignity uh, article uh, call was chaired by Howard Gregory, the bishop, the Archbishop of the West Indies, who's also the Bishop of Jamaica, and Kevin Robertson, an area bishop of Trent Scarborough in the Diocese of Toronto, uh, was on the team that helped put it together. Most of the verbiage in this call deals with reparations for uh, slavery, and specifically they're asking the Church of England and their multi-billion Pound church commissioners funds to pay uh, compensation and reparation to those trafficked for slavery. This is reparations business this is a big deal for Bishop Gregory of Jamaica. Yes. <laughs> um, now the original call and then there's uh, some other stuff uh, in there. Now the original call as published and released on Friday the 22nd of April of July had a preamble, and this preamble sort of laid out, here's what's in this call, and here's what we're going to do. And we have three things we're going to talk about, one, two, three, and vote on. The third item listed that would be voted on was to reaffirm Lambeth 110, the resolution from 1998, that said the homosexual practice is incompatible with Christian scripture and belief, and we cannot recommend same-sex marriages or blessings or things like that. Now hold on, in case there is confusion out there, we have a wide audience, this is correct. Scripture uh, does not allow for the blessing of um, same-sex unions, relationships, marriages. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I need you, you know, in case you didn't know that, this is a correct presumption of the Scripture, the tradition of the Church, and reason. So, George, continue on. Okay, and this preamble was not written by the group who prepared the call. This preamble was written by the sort of inner core of five or six people, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, who basically gathered it up and published everything. Well, as has been reported uh, here and on Anglican Inc., the liberals went ballistic. Uh, gay activists in the Church of England said, by reaffirming Lambeth 110, we are short-circuiting the whole living in love and faith process where we're talking about whether or not we can have gay blessings in the Church of England. The American, some American and Welsh and Scottish and Canadian bishops put out protests saying, well, we're not going to pay any attention to this because we already are doing gay marriage and nothing you say or do is going to change that and we're going to move that this whole call business be kicked out. Well, this so it, it was published on friday it was brought up formally uh, on monday and on tuesday uh the same day that the primate of south india's uh, passport is taken a lot of stuff happened on tuesday <laughs> the, it, the the inner core group met with gay activists and liberal bishops and re reissued the lambeth call on human dignity and essentially the major change was taking out the preamble. So they say, well, Lambeth 110 is still mentioned here, but it was mentioned in the context of its point that we, Lambeth 110 calls us to love and cherish gays and those means it didn't mention the core uh, teaching, which is homosexual practices incompatible with Christian doctrine and scripture and, mm -hmm. scripture and tradition and whatnot. At a th at, and so Lambeth 110 was off the table. Well, this caused uh, a conservative reaction. Sam Margrave, who is a member of General Synod, a lay member, sent us a copy of a letter that he had sent to Justin Welby. 
uh, which we published on Anglican Inc. Sam was a conservative member of General Senate and a bit of a firebrand. Sam said, look, if you don't allow this, I'm going to bring forward a vote of no confidence in you at our next meeting of Synod, because if you, if you are unable to affirm the clear words of scripture, you have no business being the Archbishop of Canterbury. And this is not just an idle threat, because there are enough conservatives and liberals who don't like Justin Welby in Synod, where he can actually be embarrassed by having this vote of no confidence. And simultaneously, Welby had an interview with the Times of London saying, oh, I'm gonna stay until I'm 70 for four more years, unless people don't want me. Well, guess oh, what, well, Justin? Guess what? <laughs> the <laughs> writing's on the wall. Yeah. You might be facing a vote of no confidence if you don't put Lambeth 110 back in. Well, but we're, Not, we're in the time that we're redefining words. No confidence could be redefined as super confident in him. That's yeah, true. That's it true. could very well be. Yeah. Well, the Global South Anglicans before the conference, and that's the group representing the 75% of Anglicans in the world mm -hmm. in terms of active population. Uh, those bishops who are not p participating in the GAFCON boycott who are going have put out a statement uh, but through their leader, uh, Justin Badiarama of South Sudan and James Wong of the Indian Ocean mm -hmm. saying, uh, we want Lambeth 110 to be reaffirmed. We have four goals, which is uh, that the Orthodox stick together, that uh, we are uh, firm and uh, evangelism and mission uh, that uh, basically we uphold uh, doctrine and tradition in scripture and I encourage you to read their statement uh, to get the exact wording which has just escaped my mind that's all right <laughs> but but this was released uh, in early July mm -hmm. and so I've been asking the Global South representatives who are on site at Lambeth Canterbury uh, well, what are you going to do now that the big thing that you went out of this conference is gone? And they have been telling me for a few days, hold on, hold on. People are in the air. They're traveling. Our people are not microblogging and tweeting every five seconds. As, as Kevin mentioned, the liberals have a disproportionately loud voice on social media. Let's wait till everybody's here. And this morning, the Global South had a press conference and they released some statements which we published and they made two statements that they are going to push ahead with 110 and they're going to boycott the Eucharists over this same-sex issue. Now we did a little bit deeper dive in so what exactly is happening with 110? How can we say it's going to go be back on the agenda? Well they're going to meet with Justin Welby tomorrow Saturday and let and basically find out from him what are the mechanics of bringing this before the conference yeah how can we I'll, do a resolution from the floor you yeah. know that type of thing sure and <clears throat> now and in some respects justin Welby is in a bit of a bind because he keeps saying that this is not a legislative group and we let the conference decide things and we want the bishops to have their voice heard and if he shuts this down He's basically denying all the things he said ahead of time. So they're they're going, and on Monday they'll present the text, and they'll and they'll have the opportunity for the bishops to endorse it. And even if it's not formally accepted, they're still going to push ahead. And whoever doesn't sign this resolution will be deemed not to be on board. Lambeth One Ten will be you know, abstention will be confounded a no. It's kind of a Christian litmus test or a Christian bishop litmus test. Well, I want to talk to you about something. If they're going to have a vote on this, I've noticed in pictures on Twitter and Facebook that there's shadow bishops running around. Uh, bishops who are retired, bishops who I didn't know were invited. Uh, would this give Justin Welby an opportunity to, to pad the vote you know they've not they've I've asked but so far they've not given me a list of those present mm -hmm. either in the aggregate or in I've wanted an individual list sure 
because that way I could see, is there anybody from Uganda, Rwanda, or uh, Nigeria? How many Kenyan bishops actually are there? Even after Jackson, Oli Sapit said, don't go. They've not given out this information. But in looking at pictures and at social media, I see retired bishops. Uh, I saw Bill Franklin, who in mm -hmm. 2019 retired as Bishop of Western New York. I see Jenny Andes Addison, retired Toronto bishop, who is now a parish priest. She's there with her husband. Right, but and the and question, she's, not, she's not a bishop. At all, you know, she, she, she's a former bishop, mm -hmm. but she does not exercise Episcopal office. Uh, I don't see Ed Little, Dan Martin, or John <laughs> no. Howe, or uh, Jack Eicher, or Bob Duncan there. Bishop Love. Uh, uh, or yeah. Bob Bill. Uh, yeah. But so, or Bill Love, but yeah. the question, and so without a hard numbers and without a list, we can't really say, oh, it, you know, this is submission is, are they padding the numbers by getting in, uh, you know, people not really, who do not meet the criteria that they've announced that active service bishops are going to be invited. Yeah. I so, would think it, w it would behoove greatly the global south to get that list and make sure there is an official quorum uh before in, any votes are taken or they'll be surprised as <clears throat> president trump was surprised by uh, the the vote when it's finished so yeah it's the other th the other thing that the global south has said that i think is very very important is that the opening eucharist where they process in and in canterbury cathedral in their vestments and it's the big it's the picture day. It's the day that you'll see in uh, Wiki, you know in Wikipedia entries for future la about the Lambeth Conference. Mm -hmm. The day uh, they've advised the Global South primates have advised their bishops to remain seated during Holy Communion. The same sp sex spouse, same gender spouses of gay bishops who are at Lambeth were told they couldn't come. A number of them have come. Mm -hmm. And they are allowed to eat with their, their same-sex spouse. They're allowed to go to worship with them. They're not allowed to go to Bible study. Which so, would benefit them the most. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Bad and, strategy. And so, um, and we know this by social media posts of seeing pictures of these. You know, well, but they're people. actually wearing credentialed uh, lapels uh as far as i can tell they have some type of credentialed uh i was invited but i'm still here uh tag on their thing yes and the the, the lanyard you know blue is for exhibitors and press is another color and purple is for bishops and the spouse and spouses and these spouses who are not invited have purple lanyards um so I don't, you know, <clears throat> things are getting a little itchy here. Uh, I very much doubt that Justin Welby is at that level of, unless he's a super control freak, I very much doubt he's <laughs> doing there. Yeah. But, okay, and so the Global South primates have said, look, we will not receive Eucharist with those bishops who are actively and continuously violating the, the received understanding of sexual ethics in the church, in the Anglican world. Mm -hmm. And again, if Welby pushes back on this, he's sort of hurting himself because Emma Ineson is uh, the Bishop at Lambeth, who was his uh, aide de camp, uh, did a uh, did a video broadcast, did a video interview with the Religion Media Center, where she said, "Well, you know, Lambeth 110." is the position of the Anglican Communion. It was overwhelmingly adopted 500 something to 70 something. It, it is a fact on the ground. She wasn't saying this is what it must be, but she was saying, you know, this is why we mention it because it is what it is. And if, so the, the whole liberal argument, well, that was then, this is now, the Archbishop's staff is torpedoed by saying this still applies. Lambeth 110 is still the no. received yeah. view of the Anglican world. And it doesn't matter that the Episcopal Church of the USA, the vast majority of its bishops have torn up that understanding. Mm -hmm. 
because in 1998, the majority of Episcopal bishops voted for Lambeth 110. I was there, I know, we counted, mm -hmm. and I had the list of everybody. And, you know, during the, the thing, you check off the hands is what they did. Um, it was only in 2008 that they kept the names of those present secret from us because they were embarrassed about the boycotts. So this Justin Welby had intended this Lambeth be about social issues, primarily climate change and the poor and all that stuff. It's listening to the BBC, you know, talk to their uh, uh, desk. You know, the desk in, in London is asking, so what's new, what's interesting? And it's all sex. <laughs> you know? Well, <laughs> yes, it is all sex because it this issue has divided and torn the communion. You know, mm -hmm. let's be honest here. We keep talking about it because it's still a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. The biblical guidelines, the church guidelines, the tradition guidelines, and the, the reason guidelines are being thrown out by uh, the Western portion of our church. And the global south is getting kind of sick of this. And that's why we have a partial gathering of bishops. People decided to stay away. And right now, I'm thinking, you know, GAFCON made the right decision uh, because how things are being thrown around so impolitely at, at Lambeth uh, and not going. I, I, I kind of wish they had gone, but now that I see the, the basic uh, systematic corruption at Lambeth, I'm like, oh, they did the right thing, George. They stayed away. Well, my, my uh, gut would have been to, st to be there mm -hmm. and work with, uh, because I'm fearful because the Global South team is not very well resourced in terms of manpower and just bodies on the ground to mm -hmm. distribute something to 600, 700, 800 bishops it takes a lot of manpower if you need to do it within a half hour. Yeah. Two guys in a photocopier can't pull it off, but that's different. I mean, uh, in 1998, uh, there was the manpower there to achieve these ends and the money to pay for the infrastructure to, to do this, copiers but, and printers. But they also had the corruption in 1998. They lost Lambeth 110, George. So you can't me, tell not me. meaning they <laughs> meaning they lost the actual text of the resolution yeah. between the meeting and getting it to the secretariat. The, Oops. The bishop, bishop uh, Duncan something of of uh, Johannesburg or King, the, the yeah. white South African liberal in charge yeah. misplaced it and had you he had to rewrite it from memory which as one of the Australian bishops, Sydney bishops said, this isn't what we'd agreed upon. <laughs> and uh, well, the rest yeah. is history. The, uh, this is a really going to be messy for Justin Welby. And at the press conference this morning, he looked pissed. Uh, he, ha he sometimes adopts this, uh, as Gavin described it, almost like a snake-like visage. Um, yes, he has <laughs> the eyes narrow, and you're like, uh-oh, Justin's mad. His neck, his, his neck seems to get smaller, but his uh -huh. collar seems to get bigger. Um, no, seriously, he, he does change, and his uh, visage does betray his, in my view, his emotions. And um, Tim Thornton, uh, one of his assistant bishops, was very clear that uh, it's all my fault. It's all my fault that this poor communications uh, about uh, the preamble and how this has been done and it's all my fault entirely my fault and Justin is sort of looking at him like yes it's god damn it your fault <laughs> and you're not dumping me on this no um so but he's just being beaten up and and at the press conference he had it he, he had, there were no softballs at the press conference this morning okay Episcopal well hold news sir I, I want to know. I don't want to run out of time before we get to your question. What did you ask Justin Welby? Uh, well, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. You're going to build up to it, okay? Okay, That's let fine. me build up to it. I, right. You know, pretend pretend we're in a bar and I'm telling you a long-winded story. Just eat it. some more peanuts until I get there. I'll uh, get the beer. <laughs> Pistol News Service asked a question. Basically, what? How could you be so damn stupid to put in the preamble? Uh, David Virtue asked a question. Uh, about the Orthodox bishops and the gay bishops and it, just the, his language just so put their teeth on edge 
uh, that they refuse to answer. But that's why I that's why I love David Virtue. He is the monkey wrench of questions. He will drive them crazy. So uh, good for you, David. And then I asked a question, and then Welby gave a little answer about uh, reaffirming their point that this is not a legislative meeting. Uh, things will be taken home and acted upon. And then he had a little ending. These will either be acted on either the province or the diocesan level to be put into effect. And then nasty little George Conger asks a question. I say, Bishop in 2007, Rowan Williams wrote to John Howe, which was Central Florida, and answered the question, what is the central unit of the Anglican communion? Where does authority lie? Is it in the province or the diocese? Is Rowan the, Williams. Well, or he, his question was, is it in the, in the, the instruments of unity? Is it in at the province level? Where does this exist? Where do we find our unity? And, or, or the central unit, mm -hmm. um, uh, that unifying person around whom we gather, it's the bishop, it's the diocese, Rowan Williams said, it's not the province. Yeah. And this was an argument used in the lawsuits, theologically speaking, with the ACNA and the Episcopal Church. Sadly, it didn't sway a lot of judges. It did have impact in other places. So that's why we had California go one way, Texas the other, New York one way, Illinois the other. Yeah. Um, right. So and I said South Carolina went both ways. What, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Oh man. So I said, now from an ecclesia, I hear what you're saying. Is this just sort of like a throwaway tagline? Or are you making an ecclesiological statement on church doctrine and polity of how Anglicanism works? I don't think I was succinct as that in my question, but, and Justin Welby had this look like I kicked him in the nuts and everybody's silent for about 15, 20 seconds and at the, at the table. And Justin Welby begins to answer by saying, traditional Anglican polity is that the diocese is the unit central place in church life of, of public life. So he affirmed Rowan Williams' statement. But then he went on to say, however, in practice, it varies widely uh, across the communion. He said, in the Church of England, dioceses have a high degree of autonomy. Uh, it's only certain things are, are not part of their, their power structure. Whereas in other provinces, the dioceses are merely subunits of the province. So from a, theolog from a theological perspective, it's the diocese but in practical matters, we have to look at each province of the Anglican Communion. In Australia, the diocese uh, have to affirm what General Synod uh, does. The dioceses mm -hmm. have a great deal of autonomy. In some African provinces, the diocese have next to no autonomy. I agree. Yeah. The Episcopal Church, up until Catherine Jefford Shorey and the lawsuits of 10 years ago, we had a great deal of autonomy. And this is where we bring in uh, Alan Haley, if he would come back, uh, to talk about uh, this issue, both under law and uh, church polity. And Catherine Jefford Shorey was one of her myriad sins was changing unilaterally the polity of the, Ang of the Episcopal Church without changing the constitution or canons. Right, because when she was in charge, 815 was in charge and made decisions mm -hmm. for diocese. Even a diocese uh, in Virginia run by Peter Lee, Peter Lee was making agreements with churches that wanted to leave. And she, through some authority she thought she had, stopped that. And mm -hmm. she shouldn't have been able to because that right belongs to the diocese. Yeah. So, in other words, Justin Welby wants to have a press conference talking about global warming and youth ministry and mosquito nets and ENS is beating them up on being mean to gays David Virtue is talking about gay bishops and George Conger is asking obscure questions about uh, ecclesiology that uh, can only cause him grief next time he talks to Mike Curry uh, that it is the diocese so lay off of uh, <laughs> Albany and uh, Dallas and Tennessee and Central Florida and all these places because mm -hmm. they are being true to what is Anglican. You're just being pseudo Roman Catholic. Um, so it, it, we're off to a fun start. We, yeah. Now whether <laughs> I can get up at three a.m. every day is another question. But 
Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, this is day one, uh, officially. They had their little get together, but uh, uh, we're gonna have to see what happens. You know, it, it's it's not really a Lambeth conference. It's a partial Lambeth gathering. Um, you know, it's kind of like when they had the primates gathering. You know, not everybody there is in agreement until we can finally get an agreement on Lambeth 110. Why do we have to get sex right? We have to get sex right. We're a church. We are we are counter to the culture. We offer good yeah. news. We offer transformational uh, living. We got to get this right. If you look on social media this morning, after the Global South statement was released, you see howls of outrage from the left. And you say predictions of what's going to happen. Darwin McCullough is an Oxford professor of church history. He's a gay man. He's a, uh, very outspoken on these issues. Mm -hmm. He basically is saying Lambeth, Ang the Anglican Communion is done. It's over. Bec and, and he said, you know, first off, there's the gross incompetence. Those are his words in the calls. And second, we can't tell each other what to do. So where we're headed is basically an Anglican version of the Lutheran World Federation, where, you good. know, where, you know, uh, you, you gather together at a Shriners convention sort of thing and um, exchange badges. Uh, we're not, we're no longer a Catholic church mm -hmm. uh, is where McCullough is going. And that's, that's the line the liberals are taking. In fact, uh, Andrew uh, uh, Forshu Foster Kane, uh, He's the London uh, chaplain who uh, got in trouble and wasn't licensed because he's in a same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. He tweeted that uh, maybe we just need to start a branch of the Episcopal Church here in England. Um, that would they, be Catherine uh, Shorey's desire. So. The liberals this morning <clears throat> hearing the Global South pushing back, they're not panicking, but they're very angry. Because yeah, they thought they, they, are, they would be pushovers. They were the cost for victory. Yeah. With, the Nigeri with the Nigerians and the Ugandans and the Rwandans away, mm -hmm. they felt they were free to play. Now we're seeing the South Sudanese and the Congolese and the Seychellois, you know, people who have no business telling uh, a gay activist in London what to do, they're about to tell them what to do. Yeah. And that just isn't on for them. And I'm kind of proud of you know South Sudan for taking that and being able to communicate beyond uh, the Lambeth pressers. You know they they have access to the internet now. They're putting out videos. They're putting out statements, and they have separate pressers that are being attended. You know mm -hmm. one of the things before was uh, in 1998, and we saw this a little bit in 2008, was uh, Lambeth turning off the microphones when they got to speak and uh you know sent into the wrong room when it's time to give their little uh presentation on uh something uh politically important to lambeth so i i'm proud of south sudan for stepping up and uh putting the mic on and putting uh their thoughts uh before everybody not just the 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 lambeth press so it's so it's crazy george to to be able to watch this from afar Let's see. It's it's not. It how should I put this? Um, this there was a press conference which Kevin and I are in a great position because everything's televised from yeah. Lambeth. We really don't have to be there, and so we don't have to shell out the thousands of dollars to go to England, which is an expensive place. They're meeting in the Great Hall at the University of Can Canterbury. And they're leaving the doors open because the Great Hall has no air conditioning. Uh, and England is going through a heat wave. And Kevin and I are, are uh, men of manly size. And uh, don't want a sweater. It's hot. You know, yes. toting cameras around and microphones and having to sit in makeshift little seats and uh, with no air conditioning. It's a miserable time. Well, and, even as a press person, you would dress as a priest. You would have the collar on. I, no, I, I would wear coat and tie. Then coat I would and tie. Coat, it was and coat and tie. Okay. I never ever okay. would wear a collar at Gafcon or at uh, Lambeth. Okay, but I, I remember I you were all dressed up. I would still wear the T-shirt. Yeah, I would be out there in the polo shirt, and you'd be just gobs of sweat coming down. And you, I need some water, Kevin. Well, this time around, the the proceedings are on uh, YouTube and Facebook live, and you can watch mm -hmm. them. 
Well, the one thing that isn't so far is the Global South press conference, and they've promised that they'll record it and post it. But I'm a little leery as to what happened because the ENS correspondent who was there said, wow, the press conference with Justin Badiarama and James Wong was the wildest press conference I've ever been to. So I'm dying to know what well, happened. You find out, yes. <laughs> well, well, hopefully we'll see the video shortly, but... Yeah. This is this is interesting. This is a good place to be if you're a church reporter. Mm -hmm. If you're a secular, it's a good topic to cover because lots going on. If you're a secular reporter, this is a snooze uh, because you know who cares anymore. Yeah, it's all inside politics, and um, you know it's inside baseball. That's why you watch this show. (laughs) That's right, (laughs) because that's all we do is inside politics. Uh, The 3,000 or so faithful viewers that show up here every week, we really appreciate it. Um, And as much as Lambeth is something we report on, it's also something we pray about. You know, these are the leaders of the Anglican Communion gathering. And we, we ask, if not demand, that the Holy Spirit come upon this gathering and bring people to repentance and unity again. Um, And that, you know, the yeses and yeses are in the noes are noes. You know, that we don't have confusion. And we, we sadly today, I, I see confusion. Yeah. Put yourself in poor Justin Welby's position. Mm-hmm. Um, he values keeping the institution on, on its wheels. And you've got the left attacking him. You've got the right undermining his agenda. You have members of General Synod calling for his ouster. You have obnoxious reporters asking, when did you beat your wife questions? Um, he can't catch a break. Um, and he's supported by a staff that's really not that good so that they make these boneheaded mistakes that just make things worse for him. So his unpleasant demeanor this morning, I think is slightly justified. And I feel badly for him because I just wish him, I pray that God's peace enter into his heart and he have a clear vision of what God is calling him to do. I mean, if Christ returned tomorrow, could he stand before Jesus and say, I, I did the right thing? Or did I temporize? Well, he certainly did his best. You know, I, I you know, it, this is not his skill set. You know, he, he's, he's in over his head and you can tell that. Um, he may not want to believe that, uh, but he is. Um, I I could not do and I could not do his job. It's not like Kevin saying I could do better. I couldn't do better at all. You know. See, I, I, perhaps he should take to heart what Oliver Cromwell said: "I fear no man because I fear the Lord." Mm-hmm. Um, and Justin is basically trying to balance competing fears from interest groups in England, the Africans, and the Americans. And if uh, perhaps he put the Lord's center, well, that's presumptuous of me to say, but if he feared the Lord more than he feared people, I think he'd feel much better. My goal and my hope and my prayer is at Lambeth uh, 2032 that the Western Church won't attend because of the strong reaffirmation of Lambeth 110 by this Lambeth, and that it is the de facto teaching of uh, the primates and provinces of the Anglican Communion, and if you don't like it, don't attend. Um, it, that we're not fighting to have GAFCON not attend. We're not fighting to have the Global South not attend. We're fighting that those who do not agree with Lambeth 110, if you don't agree, please don't attend. That's my prayer. George, we put out a great show. This is this is what we do. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 744 of Anglican Unscripted.